Hi, guys. Um, thank you all for sticking with us. I know it's a long day. I know our brains are full of all the really use useful, valuable information that we've been getting so far today. I know we're all excited about the housewares show that starts tomorrow and going to check out all these new products. Um, but I'm really honored and excited to be here with you for the next 45 minutes talking about something that is very near and dear to my heart and something that I think that we don't talk enough about, which is how to pitch brands and accurately price your work. And <clears throat> I will say I have been in this industry for 11 years now, and I have been on tons and tons of panels, but this is my first time speaking by myself on a stage. Full disclosure. Um, since since my solo in the Christmas play in fifth grade. So you guys are here for like my debut return performance. And when people were asking me earlier if I was nervous, uh, my answer was, I'm not nervous about being on the stage in front of you all. I'm an Enneagram four, so I love it when things are all about me. But what makes me nervous about standing in front of you today is I want you to feel like you walk away from my talk thinking, oh my gosh, so much valuable information, so many actionable tips, because you're paying good money to be here, and you're spending your time to be here, and I want this to feel really, really useful and juicy for you. Uh, so I have some, some concrete action items for you. I have like some insider tips, and I'm gonna reveal some of my secrets, but just as important, I want you guys to walk away feeling like you got the biggest confidence shot in the butt and I want you to feel like the total badasses that you are because we're here talking about influencer marketing and influencer marketing wouldn't exist without you, the influencers. You are so important. Your voice is valuable. Your perspective is valuable. The audience that you spend day in and day out building, brands want access to that and I want you to guard it and protect it and cherish it like the precious entity that it is. So that's my goal for today's talk. Um, you can see my website and my Instagram handle here, as well as Influenced and the Instagram handle for Influenced. And I'll talk a little more about Influenced throughout, um, throughout my talk. So, oh, I have, the slides, I have the slide changer here. There we go. So this is me and Sage. Um, <clears throat> I'll tell you a little bit about what I've spent the last 11 years doing. I graduated from college with a degree in English, and I moved to New York City thinking I wanted to be an interior designer. And I was gonna get my master's in interior design at the Pratt Institute. I had spent my childhood going to the Laura Ashley store with my mom to pick out my bedroom furniture. I loved interior design, and after about eight weeks at Pratt, I learned I really did not want to be an interior designer. I did not care about measuring things. I just wanted to make things pretty. And frankly, I didn't want to be a student anymore. So I got a job at um, an ad agency in New York City and learned a lot about consumer strategy and graphic design. But all the while, I was sending resumes to Martha Stewart Living and Real Simple because I wanted to be an editor. Who wouldn't want to be an editor living in New York City in 2006, right? But without the relationships in the publishing industry, it just wasn't happening for me. And a mentor said, this is in 2008, why don't you just start a blog? It'll be a creative outlet, a running resume, It'll just at least be fun and a way to get this urge that is clearly inside of you out. So that's what I did. Well, actually, the backstory is a friend of me also started a blog, and I started my blog the next day. I was like, I'll be damned if she's going to have a blog and I don't. So I started my blog in 2008, um, and I was still working at, at the ad agency, but I started to really love the community aspect of blogging. And if any of you guys have been around for that long, or even kind of that long in the blogging world, you know that it used to be all about going to each other's blogs and commenting every day, and you had your blog role that, you know, you would, all your friends would be on your blog role, and the social media part, or the social part of social media, that's what it was all about, and I really started to thrive on that. And I started going to conferences, I was at the first alt conference, and, and it was like, oh my gosh, there's really something to this thing that we're doing. But we weren't in it to make money, we were in it because we loved talking about this stuff, and we loved the friends we were making, and so we just kept doing it because we were passionate about it. 
fast forward 11 years, I've written a book about interior design. I've started an online magazine, which has since changed hands like three times. I started a magazine called Rue Magazine. Um, I have built a full-time career with my social media presence. I have started a photo studio that was furnished entirely on trade with brands for all the materials we needed for the build out. I have renovated my kitchen through social media trades. I have now since started doing interior design for clients even though I decided, you know, 15 years ago I didn't want to be an interior designer. So it's become this really rich and fruitful career that didn't exist when I started. And with that has come this wild west nebulous, how the hell are we all going to make money off of this? So I have partnered with countless brands for paid and product trade collaborations. And we'll talk a little more about some of the nuances between pricing yourself for those two different types of collaborations. One of the questions that I get asked so, so much is how do I price myself? And that's a really tricky, sticky question for a few reasons. The practical one being, yeah, there are some rough standards, but it really is so case by case dependent on things like the brand and how big their budget is and how badly you want to work with them, how big your following is and how great your engagement is, how involved the work you're going to be doing is. Is it just like a quick picture that's already existing in your photo library that you're posting with some branded caption or are you having to like produce a whole photo shoot? So yes, there are rough standards for pricing, but a lot of it is, is um, case by case dependent. But the other thing, and I think like the deeper, the deeper issue around pricing and also pitching is that this is our life that we're putting on the internet for, for most of us, right? Like this is our passion that we're just sort of tossing out into the ether as representative of us and putting numbers on that, putting value on that, especially most of us in this room are women, that's really scary. I know it is for me saying, I'm worth this much, you should pay me this much, I deserve to make a living wage from my talents, my creativity, from this loyal and engaged audience I've built. That's a really vulnerable thing to say. And to, to stand up for ourselves with big brands that have all this money, that's a practice. And what I've done over the years, and it's not foolproof, like I still get the butterflies in my tummy when I'm pricing myself and when I'm pitching brands, but what I've done over the years is I've sort of created a process and a template for myself to take some of the pressure off to make it less personal, to make it mechanical, to make it just a series of steps that I go through so that at least I'm not dwelling so much over every email and being like, oh my God, can I tell them that I should ask this much? I'm not second guessing, I'm just going through the process. And so that's the process that I'm gonna share with you guys now. And I actually was having coffee with the VP of marketing at West Elm recently, and he said to me, the way that you pitch me is perfect. I get so many pitches every single day. Most of them are rubbish. The way you do it, I appreciate it so much. And you could ask me for anything, and because of the way you're asking, it, asking me, I will give it to you. So these are West Elm VP of Marketing approved tips. All right? Oh, and the other thing I'll say is like, I, I kind of like worked this process out for myself over many years of trial and error and learning the hard way what doesn't work. And then I did all of these leadership and personal growth courses recently, and they essentially like bulleted out the exact steps that I was using, which was a really nice piece of feedback. Like, oh, okay, these basic human relationship skills that it took me 10 years to learn, other people have already written books about them. <laughs> so this is, again, tried and true information. So first of all, build relationship. Um, I'm just gonna name them, and then I have a slide for each one. Number two, you're going to evoke a vision of what's possible from the collaboration, from that relationship. Number three, establish value. And value is, I think, the biggest, juiciest part of this conversation, so I'm gonna spend the most time on that. But what I'm doing here is I'm sharing with you the actual emails that I wrote for a really successful collaboration with a furniture brand called Article. And that collaboration, um, 
It was for a friend's office that I was designing, and the goal of it was to just create some beautiful content, to get her some free stuff for her office, and the really nice thing about that collaboration is those photos, even though they came out a year ago now, they've since been published in Architectural Digest, several international interiors magazines have picked them up, just today someone regrammed one of the images, so it's been a really fruitful collaboration and this is how it all started. So building a relationship. Think about how you would want to be approached. If you are, you know, Susie Smith, VP of Marketing at X Furniture Company, how do you want people to reach out to you? I know a lot of times I've heard some horror stories about um, folks reaching out and saying, just got a new house, here's the list of 10 things that I want. And if I were a, a, at a company, that would feel so grabby. And so what I do is I start out super simple. It's like a very brief email for the first for the first outreach. And so I'll read to you what I have since this print is a little small. Um, so lovely to hear from you. Your timing couldn't be better as it's been on my list to drop you a line. I do have a project that could be a perfect fit, small studio in collaboration with my business partner, Caroline, of Team Woodnote. And I link to my business partner. And then I say, last year we did a makeover of her brother's house. This year we're tackling her sister's office, which will consist of X and Y. The vibe is right in line with your brand's look of modern and cool. We will be covering it on our own social as well as pitching it to publication. So right, right away, I've established who I am and also who the other members of my team are. I've provided some links both to our social and to our previous work, right? I very briefly lay out what the project is. We're doing an office. It has a lounge and a seating area. And I say, the vibe is right in line with your brand, so kind of speaking to what her needs are because she's looking to get her needs met, right? And then I say, I, I promise we're gonna be covering it and also pitching it out. And then I say, happy to share more if it's of interest, right? It's just that first little bite to see if she's, of inter if she's interested. And of course she writes back, she's like, yes, would love to learn more. So that's where the evoking vision step of my pitch process comes in. This is where I give more information, also provide some visuals specific to the project on, at hand, and get them excited about what they could be a part of. So expanding upon my initial outreach, offering visual inspiration, and also starting to flesh out the specific ask, giving a little more context to what will this entail from you. In this case, of course, it was product only, but this would also be when you could start talking numbers for, um, for paid collaborations. So what I say here is adding my business partner to the thread, thrilled to be in touch with specifics. As I mentioned previously, here's the project we have on our plate. Um, we're providing coverage on our channels, we're pitching, plus, there's going to be lots of gorgeous content, both stills and video, that all of our brand partners will be able to use for their own channels. So wetting her whistle a little more with some original content that she will get to regram, which by the way, Article has been regramming nonstop in the year and a half since I wrote this email. <laughs> um, so then this is a tiny version of the big, juicy, colorful PDF that I sent her of our design with an article sofa, an article chair, and some of their smaller decor pieces so that she can see how her brand fits into the mix. She can see the other pieces that they're going to be in context with and decide whether she would like to continue the collaboration. That's where the established value com part comes in. And here's the, the next email in this chain where she says, yeah, tell me more, what specifically do you need? This is where I list it out bullet point by bullet point. These are the specific things we're asking for. These are the specific things you will be getting in return. And it is so important with any type of collaboration, be it a, a trade or a paid collaboration, if you don't have like a contract contract, which more and more, even for product trades, I'm finding that everyone's wanting a contract, but if nothing else, write it out in the email, and I really, really, really encourage you guys to be the ones to bring this up. Don't wait for a brand to say, okay, in exchange for these three things, we want X, Y, Z, and Q from you. Absolutely be the one to say, these are the things that I want, 
these are the things that I'm willing to deliver in return. Because that's keeping the power in your hands with regards to the deliverables that you feel are reasonable in exchange for what you're getting. Um, and so here it's just, you know, a list of product with links and the deliverables very clearly laid out. And then also down at the bottom here, asking for some material samples to get the project kicked off, but bada bing, bada boom. And then I also have, this is for a separate but similar collaboration I did with build.com for a kitchen where I full on just made a spreadsheet. And what I did at the top here is for the deliverables, I put an equivalent cash value of what I would be getting paid if it were a monetarily compensated post. So I say for one blog post with, with full social support, the equivalent cost is, is X, and in my case, that's, I said, $3,400, which is about what I, that's my starting point for conversations with brands in a paid collaboration. Um, and I bullet out each deliverable that the brand can expect from me, and the dollar value if I were getting paid, and then I do the exact same for the product that I'm requesting, and the dollar value of those, so that they can really see that yeah, it's a full kitchen's worth of stuff, but you're getting this much content and this much social coverage in return. And my God, what a bargain for you because these are, these are the, like, the recommended retail prices. You know the brand's not paying for those wholesale, so it's actually a really good bargain for them. So a spreadsheet like this can be super helpful as well. And then also, I've provided links to examples of the type of content that I've done in the past so they can go check it out, get excited about what they could be involved in, and then also links to all of the products so they can just know exactly, like I make it easy, I try to make it so brainless for them. Let's talk more about value. How to price your rates. I'm really sorry to say there's not a website you can go to and plug in, I have this many followers, therefore my Instagram posts should cost this much, my blog posts should, should cost this much. Like I said before, it's, it's kind of still a wild west. It depends on a brand's budget, depends on how much you want to make in, in for that project, but some general guidelines for coming up with what are some starting rates. I've heard that your base should be $100 per 10,000 followers on Instagram. But honestly, that's low, and it doesn't take into account a lot of things. Um, but that's like a starting point, right? So think about these things when you're pricing your work. How many hours is it going to take you to do? Like if it's going to be a huge long blog post with tons of original content and like three follow-up posts, do the math on am I gonna end up making like five cents an hour on this? Well, if you are, then you need to ask for more money. Also think about what types of resources and materials are gonna be required. You know, I'm doing an office makeover for my husband right now, and last week I went out and spent $500 on white books at thrift stores, and it's like, well, there's another $500 towards this project that I have to somehow like, figure out how I can bring on another brand to cover the $500 I just spent on white books. Just generally speaking, in your life, what's a reasonable hourly wage that you would like to be making to pay your bills? Use that number, do the math on, okay, well, if I'm working this many hours a week and creating this much content for those hours and you know, 52 weeks in a year, maybe it would be nice to take two weeks off. Like, figure that out for yourself, and that's how you come up with the hourly rate you would like to be making in your life. And then if a project for a brand is gonna be taking you 20 hours, you can, like, just roughly multiply that rate times 20 hours, right? But I think the most important bullet point here is this one about social capital. How many hours monthly do you spend cultivating social capital? And when I say social capital, what I mean by that is the trust with your audience that you have spent weeks and months and years building. Because yes, it might take me five hours to put together a sponsored Instagram post, and yes, I might make $1,300 for that sponsored Instagram post, but to have the trust of 85,000 people 
well, give or take a few bots, <laughs> right? <laughs> ha to have the trust of however many people I've spent the last 11 years building a relationship with, it hasn't just been the five hours that I took to make that one Instagram post. It's been the other 40 hours every week creating content that people access for free, replying to comments, replying to emails, spending time on stories now, right? Like we spend so much time on non-sponsored content. That is still energy and energy has value and worth. And that's where I start thinking about what is the price for brands to access that trust, to access that audience. And that's where when I say I don't think $100 for every 10,000 followers is enough, you get to mark your prices up for the trust that you have built over the years. Because every time you post something branded, even if the audience loves it, you're spending a little of that trust, which is why, you know, look at these influencers that we've all followed and loved, and then they start doing sponsored posts like every single post. That's an immediate unfollow because it starts to feel tacky. So, like, we can only post so much sponsored contest, content and still maintain our audience's trust, right? Trust itself is capital. And that's why brands should be paying a premium for access to that trust because we spend a lot of time building it. We put a lot of our heart and soul into it. These are our relationships with our audience and they get to be treated with respect and love. And that comes with a cost, right? When it comes to pitching brands and standing up for my worth in terms of pricing, something else to keep in mind is that there's an education component. There's a role we all get to play in educating brands about why the hell should they be paying us in the first place. And that can, I know for me that's uncomfortable because I don't want to be like fighting for why I should get paid. I want to be able to just say this is what my rate is and this is what it will cost to work with me. But sometimes brands have questions and I have to like take a deep breath and be like, all right, that doesn't mean they're attacking me as a person. It doesn't mean they think that like I'm greedy for asking to get paid. It just means this is an opportunity for me to educate them. And so some of the questions I get asked a lot is like, well, why, why should, and this is something that's coming up with my company Influenced as we're onboarding brands in the home space for campaigns. We're finding a lot of brands in the home space are a little more old school and they don't understand, well, why should I be paying money for influencer marketing when I've been you know, doing all these other marketing techniques. And so here's some, some important points to keep in mind for speaking to brands about why influencer marketing is valuable, why you are valuable to their marketing efforts. One, um, so influencer marketing over traditional advertising, specifically you know, a print ad in Martha Stewart Living. One reason why influencer marketing is way more desirable is think about the cost of making that print ad and publishing that print ad. That's like tens of thousands of dollars for one page in Martha Stewart Living that maybe someone will see, maybe someone will act on, versus they could spend that same amount of money on 10 influencers with gorgeous photography, extremely loyal following, they know exactly who their audience is, and they can, they can make their money go so much farther immediate access to this loyal, engaged audience versus, you know, it's a shot in the dark who's going to be seeing that page in a magazine. And yeah, maybe as a food company, you could put that magazine ad next to a recipe, but like that's the most targeted you can get. Um, also, we've talked about it today already, but the brand also gets content to use on their social feeds. And that's really valuable for them because Instagram and blogs and Pinterest, it's like this machine that needs to be fed. Um, they can track analytics. You can't track analytics on a magazine page. The best you can do is know how many subscribers there are for that magazine. But with, with an influencer campaign, you can deliver how many impressions that that got. Um, and then again, like this really niche audience that the brand can access. So all of these things that influencer marketing offers that a traditional ad page doesn't.
traditional PR. So that's another one that I get asked. Well, why can't I just send my product to an editor and hope that they publish it in a gift guide? Well, yeah, you could do that. But there's no guarantee that that editor is going to put that product in a gift guide. And you're not going to get to decide who that product is next to in the gift guide. It could be next to one of your competitors, right? There are fewer and fewer magazines and editors even to speak to. A friend of mine who does beauty PR, she's like, yeah, when I go to New York for desk sides now, it's like I can't even get in because there's three editors that every single PR person in the, in, on the planet wants to talk to. So there's like all these influencers. There's no editors left. There's a guaranteed placement if they work with you versus this shot in the dark. Uh, so that's another speaking point when it comes to why influencer marketing is much more powerful than traditional PR. And then here's the big one. What does paid influencer marketing offer over just simple product traits? Because a lot of brands are like, well, why can't I just send you my lamp and you'll put it on your Instagram and everyone will be happy? Well, obviously, we as influencers won't be happy because we can't pay our rent with lamps. But when the brand is paying you, they get a little more, obviously. They get things like they get to decide what the timeline is. Clearly, if I'm getting paid for something, I can reasonably prioritize putting that up, doing the work to create the content, posting it over something that is not paid. If a brand sends me a lamp, I can be like, yeah, maybe I'll get to this in the next two months. Thanks for the lamp. But if we have a contract that says, you're paying me $1,200 to put this post up next week and you're expecting it, like I treat that very, very seriously because it's my business, right? Um, the brand gets to have more say in the messaging. If a brand sends me a lamp on trade, I can talk about it however I want. You know, I'm going to talk about it nicely if I want to keep the relationship. But when it comes to having like bullet point messaging for a campaign that they might have, the brand gets to have a say in that if they're paying you. And then also, they can obtain additional content for their own use. So right now, I have a, a project I'm working on with Canon. And it's the first time I've seen this where they only want one Instagram post from me, but they also want five additional images, not that I'll be posting, but for them to use. That's really valuable for them. And it's no sweat off my back. I'm already shooting the printer for my office, right? So what's the big deal in giving them five more images? And I did stipulate that those are web rights usages. They would have to pay me more if they wanted to use them in print. But that's really useful for them. So this is why it's valuable for brands to pay rather than just do a product trade. So the last thing that I want to leave you guys with before we open it up for questions is a, a, a follower sent me a message that just really, really touched me. And I said at the beginning of my talk that I want you guys to walk away feeling like the badass powerhouses that you are, feeling so much worth, so much confidence in what you have to offer for brands, what you're bringing to the table. And he said, and this was totally unsolicited. Someone just messaged me this and was like, oh, a, a gut punch. He says, blogging and creating content is a daily exercise in bearing your soul and throwing it into an abyss, hoping people like it. Too often, we only hear what people hate. We got to share what we love, too. So I love all of you guys for being here, for putting yourselves out into the abyss every day. I know it takes courage and passion, 